Well, uh, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, on behalf of DEES and uh, the Department of my Migration and Global Order, I would like to give you all a warm welcome to this second uh, seminar uh, on the politics of doing uh, field research uh, in difficult uh, situations. Today, uh, we will uh, speak uh, particularly on uh, the challenges of doing field research in, in humanitarian uh, disasters. So it's the second seminar in a series uh, focusing on how to conduct empirical research in countries or places uh, affected by violent conflict or otherwise uh, representing hostile, dangerous or devastating environments <clears throat> for people living or dying there and for the researchers going there to document what's uh, going on. Researchers who work among people in difficult circumstances are often confronted with immense hardship and ethical complexities. And this is particularly the case in contexts where gross inequality, poverty, <clears throat> violence, and physical vulnerability abound, and where people have uh, no rights. Uh, uh, that's another, or, or limited uh, 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 rights. And as our qualitative research is, is predicated on, on going uh, uh, to these places and establishing uh, confident relationships with groups and individuals in, in local environments, um, empirical research in, in, in these places and, and often challenging uh, situations almost by definition means uh, putting uh, ourselves at risk or that we have to deal with risks of different kinds while doing our research. The question is then whether we are well enough prepared uh, to do that. Have we uh, received the adequate uh, training? Uh, and are our institutions, the institutions we work for and will, um, uh, uh, providing enough or even the right uh, guidance uh, for, for doing this? During the first seminar that was some three weeks ago, Roger Brett from the University of Bristol talked about how to face uh, violence in the field. And those who didn't attend uh, the webinar can find uh, the recorded uh, version on the DEES uh, webpage. On uh, June 15, we will have the third and the last uh, seminar uh, in, 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 on, on this side of the summer break. And on that seminar, Swati Paracha <clears throat> will uh, throw new light on the coloniality of research and global inequalities in knowledge production and dissemination. So you can also find that seminar now announced on our webpage. But today, uh, the seminar today, which is uh, the important thing, um, Tamara Last will discuss the place of empathy, uh, empathy and emotions in research uh, in academic environments and project management. She will also touch on the sometimes uh, problematic notion of objectivity that may function either as a distancing or sil silencing mechanism a coping strategy or a privilege. Her talk will also address what make people vulnerable to uh, uh, secondary traumatic stress, but also how persons with trauma experiences may possess useful skills for coping. As many of you have already seen in the invitation, uh, Tamara Last completed her doctoral research on deaths uh, along southern borders in uh, 2018 at the Free University in Amsterdam. And as part of uh, her doctoral research, she managed the Death at the Borders database. And it is through this work uh, that I first came to know uh, uh, of Tamara and to appreciate uh, her work. After completing her PhD, uh, Tamara wrote an article reflecting on the implications of conducting traumatogenic research. Traumatogenic, I have difficulties with that word. <clears throat> uh, traumatogenic research, as well as several other articles on the phenomenon of border death. 
and she has just finished a postdoctoral fellowship at the African Center for Migration and Society uh, in uh, Johannesburg, during which uh, she studied uh, the logics behind African migration policies. Throughout my own work on the politics and challenges of doing empirical research in, in, in insecure places or seemingly hopeless situation, Tamara has uh, been a good companion and contributed uh, valuable insight during several unlike, uh, unlike online talks. And uh, I know her as, as one of the former most experts on, on the topics, which is also why I am particularly happy that she has accepted to present her work today. Before I give the word uh, to Tamara, I should just uh, give you a little guidance on how this will work. So the seminar is live streamed, but will also be available in a recorded version later on. Today, Tamara will talk for some 30 minutes, after which she and I will have a brief discussion. Then we open up the screen for comments and questions uh, from the audience. Unfortunately, we cannot have uh, any uh, uh, live interaction. Uh, our format does not allow for that. But I uh, encourage all of you to use uh, the Q&A function that will stay open uh, throughout um, uh, the webinar. And uh, my, my great colleague, uh, Trine Rosenberg, uh, who is head of the DEES conference section uh, and also assisting us uh, with the technique, uh, will give a few comments uh, along the way uh, on the chat. But for those of you attending, please use uh, the Q&A uh, uh, Q uh, function uh, for both comments and direct questions. And with these words of introductions, Tamara, please let us hear what you have to say. Thank you very much, Nina. Um, I will then start with the caveat that I'm not at all an expert, <laughs> but and very much still learning about how to bring these issues into my research and still tending towards um, sidelining them when actually I do think they have and, and I appreciate very much the invitation to talk today because I, it gives me an opportunity to remember um, and to remind myself that these are things that we still need to work on very much in academia. Um, so what I'm presenting is not an expert <laughs> um, uh, uh, opinion or, or perspective, but rather a collection of experiences and reflections that I've gone through at various points. Um, and I'm actually probably going to say things that are a bit different from the article that I published precisely because my reflections are still developing. Um, so I will give a little bit of context and a bit of a descriptive methodology um, of what my PhD was like. Um, anyone who would like to read the actual academic output can find it online quite easily, but um, I'll give a descriptive methodology and bring you back there with me for a few minutes. Then, and then I have two questions um, that I will try to say something about something hopefully useful. Um, so, as you said, I had um, uh, uh, I was looking at the role of um, European migration policies in border deaths, and it seems um like a very long time ago but at the time when i started actually it was not a topic that many people were talking about at all i remember finding um trying to create a network of people who were working on this subject and there were maybe 10 of us maximum in the room and by the time that was in 2013 right before the lampedusa the famous lampedusa shipwreck um and by the end of our research project in 2018, we invited a conference of all the people working on it, and there were some 250 people there. Um, so in the course of my PhD, it uh, became a, a huge research subject. But at the beginning, we were really dealing with a lot of unknowns. Um, and it was a, a topic, because we were dealing a lot with a lot of unknowns, I think that also came into, um, 
how how it went the fact that the research design was quite ended up being quite reactive we were very keen to get into the field because there wasn't anything to read i couldn't do a very um there wasn't there wasn't much of a literature review to do at least in terms of collecting data there was of course the work of um not to say that there was nobody working on it there was of course the work of united against racism um and um the uh, and fortress europe um so there there were but these tended to be in civil society sectors and not so much academic um research so um what did it involve uh it meant we we decided we were looking for evidence so we had a lot of data that was coming from news reports um on how many people had died and that tended to be how people knew about this uh, so there was a lot of work being done by journalists but there was not very reliable or very useful information coming out of official um uh, uh, sources so we thought we would go um and use the death management system which records deaths um, for public health and public safety reasons. Um, and is this kind of big bureaucratic machine that just collects and generates data and paperwork. And we would follow the paperwork and collect as much information as possible on people who's, um, who had died, at, at least those who had been processed, uh, whose, whose bodies had, been, had arrived in Europe in one way or another. Um, so that basically involved going from, we, we didn't know where to look. We didn't know who we were looking for. Um, uh, we just had a, 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 a source. Um, so we, and nobody had negotiated access to the, although theoretically death management and death records are accessible by the public, it's, there's not been that many studies where people have independently attempted to enter those archives and collect data. There are a few examples, but not many. So we had to negotiate access. We had to figure out which municipalities we were going to search. We had to, um, and then we had to physically go through the books um, of death records, of, of death certificates. And as we went, we realized that actually there were not that many deaths, uh, that, that there were other documents um, and that death records were not always formally registered because precisely because we were looking for people who were considered to be illegal immigrants. Um, so their, their, their death records were not always properly processed. And so we had to expand and sometimes search, physically search spaces for things we, we didn't know what we were looking for. In the end, we went to, I think, close to 600 municipalities um, and searched through over 2 million death certificates um, in the space of 10 months. So um, it was very fast and very intense field work. And I say we because I was not doing it by myself, but we um, but I was working alongside um, and, and coordinating 11 other researchers who were mostly um, activists and personally motivated um, to be involved in this research. Many of them were either in the middle of doing masters or PhDs or were, um, were, had just recently completed. So we were a young team of very sort of personally motivated people. So it became a mission. Um, and, and it was a lot of detective work and um, a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, a lot of, of, of struggling to get access to something that we didn't know what it was. Um, and then there's the, then the condition. So once we had managed to negotiate, and sometimes that we had to go through very hostile interactions um, with street level bureaucrats where we were not, um, what, some researchers had doors slammed in their faces or were told to get out or shouted at or told that we were doing something terrible. Um, not everybody was like that. We also had some incredibly friendly and welcoming people, several civil servants who came forward saying, yes, please, I've been waiting here. I've collected um, this data. I knew someone would want to know about this. Um, eventually, so I'm so glad. Um, and a lot of people wanted to share their experiences of recording and trying to figure out what to put into death certificates and death records. 
Um, but there were also very hostile situations sometimes and explicit racism and um, uh, 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 yes, mocking of what we were doing even once we had got access. Um, and then there's the conditions of working in an archive. And, and while you're not dealing with people directly, you're dealing with the paperwork, rem the documented remnants. Um, there's sometimes a lot of very gruesome details. Um, but one of the things that stands out about many of the, the, um, the people whose, whose death records we were, deaths we were recording is that you would be looking through uh, a, death, a, a whole big book of death certificates and details about where they were and when they died and who they were and who they were related to and so on. And then you would come across this blank thing with just illegal immigrant written at the top um, or gruesome details or um, died at sea or, and, and that dehumanizing aspect of it was also very confronting. And then you're in a dark, often quite a dark room with uh, strobe lighting. I mean, archives are not designed to be kind of living spaces, right? Um, so it's often sort of some dingy, damp room in the back somewhere where you're, uh, with as many shelves crammed in as possible. And um, you, you, we had to spend, we had to go through 2 million death certificates. So that's a lot of paper to flip through, a lot of paper cuts. Um, so it's it's and it and and then you're alone in this cold dark room with no natural daylight dealing with death can being confronted by death and and um, and dehumanization and and being alone with it um, and we were often alone because we had to cover such a huge um, area we most of the time we were doing this we were alone in those rooms which I think also got to it. And because we were traveling and moving from municipality to municipality, we were away from our support structures. We were um, going back after having spent the whole day um, confronting these things. We were then going back to empty hotel rooms where we didn't know anyone, eating alone. Um, so we learned um, and started teaming up a bit more or we encouraged um, people to bring along their partner or a friend or take um, a couple of days off to enjoy because often we were on the coast, this beautiful tourist destinations actually. Um, so take a couple of days to recover from before moving on to the next um, to the next place. But we also had a lot of time pressure and because we had such a huge um, area to cover. So, and because negotiation, of access meant that you had to go back to a municipality and sometimes sit there the whole day. Um, then we were committing sad, disturbing details. You have to go over and you have to check. And in order to make sure, especially when we started looking at other documents, you have to make sure that, you know, if you're looking at, uh, at a cadaver report and a death certificate, you need to look at those details uh, because we don't most of the time there are no names so you have to look at those details and um, in order to try and match up the different documents because we decided that very early on that the database was going to have to be an individualized database that we were going to have to do something to correct the dehumanizing um, uh, way that this data had been generated um, so it's spending a lot of time matching up details. It's spending a lot of time going over them and over them and over again, which means that you commit them to memory, which means that even when you're not looking at that data, it's haunting you and following you around. Um, and that was also especially difficult when um, after we'd released the database um, and we did, we released it to the public. It became very much a bit of an activist project. Um, but when we had released it, then, um, then I came back to it later to analyze it. And then that was also kind of re-traumatizing going back over those details again. But it also meant that I developed this very kind of intimate relationship with these, with the, the individuals whose data I had recorded. Um, and I had to, because there was so little information, you, you use your imagination and your empathy to kind of fill in details. So you get something about, a man and a child, right? 
um, who have been found uh, uh, drowned after a shipwreck. And then your first thought is, okay, and where's the mother? Um, if Was there a mother? Where is she? And, and did she also die? Is she one of the ones who wasn't found? Is, so you imagination also plays, I think, a, an important role in hum, rehumanizing um, in order to be able to kind of cope with the what you're looking at and going and the kind of information you're going through and the confrontation of how <laughs> unpleasant, um, how 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 racist and 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 discriminatory um, uh, the, the treatment of migrants is, and it is very blatant when you're looking at it, right? Um, so and because it's all death. I mean, there wasn't any success stories. There couldn't be any success stories. Um, there was no survivals. There was no, at best, the best thing that could happen is that someone's identity had been properly um, recognized in these death records. Um, and so, so there's that, yeah, there's all the, so the, I mean, I think a lot of people think of traumatizing research as being involving direct contact with somebody who's also traumatized. And not to say that that isn't the case, but I think it's, we need to think a little bit more broadly about also what the subject matter of what you're confronting and the kind of context in which you're working, actually the working conditions of being a researcher in the field um, and how much that also can um, impact what it's like. Um, and then there's this sense of responsibility that grows. And part of that, I think we all felt in the team very responsibility, a huge responsibility to witness um, and to collect every piece of information we possibly could with the idea that nobody was going to go back and do that kind of um, research, that there might not be another opportunity um, to collect this data and that it might help someone, that it might help someone to find their relative, that it might, um, um, help to demonstrate what was going on in a different, in a more sort of evidential way. Um, but we also, I also, because I was coordinating 11 researchers along with a colleague of mine, we, we also were very responsible for them. Um, so that meant being available 24 um, seven for, for whatever they needed. It meant doing, picking up the work they couldn't handle. It meant trying to find different ways to kind of, because we had a professional relationship. We, I mean, we became very close friends, but we also had a professional relationship. So finding ways to understand um, what was going on and to identify when someone was struggling and needed to kind of be encouraged to take a break or, in, or, or and so I, I long conversations over the phone with researchers sort of, and eventually that sort of breaking that and going, okay, how can we, help you to what do we need to what would make this better because we can't um you can't stop <laughs> it's not an option or not permanently anyway um but how can we make this an, an easier experience and you know like i said before teaming up and not being alone with it was very helpful um and recognizing that people needed to go home in order to rest and couldn't rest necessarily in a hotel room um so yes, yeah, so there was a lot of that we had to learn on the job. I mean, we were, yes, quite um, naive and not properly trained. Um, I didn't get any training in project management. I didn't get any training in how to supervise field researchers. I didn't get any training in, in um, traumatization. I didn't, so there was a lot of, of, of this was being instinctive. And that's also what Roddy Brett said in the last session, right? That you're, you're having, because there's this kind of lack of training of this assumption that if you know how to do sampling techniques, then you're sorted <laughs> for doing research methods. Um, and so uh, a lot of it relies then on your instinct. Um, and that's where I also think that empathy and kind of coping skills are actually quite valuable and under appreciated because that's what is getting researchers through this in the end. Um, but heavy reliance on that also means it can go badly wrong. Um, so, and then there was the bigger project. So my PhD was in a, a research project um, that involved five other researchers that was um, 
about the whole context. So uh, looking at different issues, humanitarian, humanitarianism and, and border control and the legal sides of things. And so there, were, there was a bigger project, but because we were at least the people who were involved, the, the, the sort of organization, the trauma of the subject and the details and so on. And because several of us were going into the field because it was such intensive field work. Um, I've, we, I think what ended up having, we, we kind of, the trauma also became pervasive in the organization, which meant that any one individual who was struggling was not able to get from the organization um, the support that they needed. Um, and that kind of created, and it's sim similar to sort of, you know, my own uh, traumatization or my own traumatic reaction was affecting field researchers and then, um, yeah, so I, I think that also was something that we didn't realize even at the time how pervasive how pervasive this was becoming and how much we had isolated ourselves from people who were not in the project. Um, and therefore there were no kind of external checks. Um, and nobody who, yes, which meant you can easily pile on, pile on the work, <laughs> pile on the intensity of it. So I could go on about what it was like for a long time, but I will <laughs> stop for a minute. Um, I mean, because I think it's quite inevitable um, and unavoidable that researching a persisting ongoing injustice like border deaths um, has an emotional impact on the researchers who are um, investigating and analyzing and thinking about this all the time. Um, so I think that's inevitable. The question is, what do we do about that emotional impact and how do we understand it and how do we cope with it and, and where does it go? Um, and I think it's often that the emotional side of doing research is sort of relegated to your personal life, your private life. It's nothing to do with your, your professional job as a researcher. It, it, it becomes the, a burden you carry in your own world away from um, the institution through which you are being exposed um, to these kinds the, to, to, to um, traumatic situations and working conditions. Um, it's somehow, I think, considered counter to be to the display of emotions is considered sort of somehow a a problem for objectivity, a problem for, or even sort of a threat to objectivity. If you're too angry, you can't be objective. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with how we've constructed objectivity. Um, that objectivity means distance, that it means um, uh, taking away that personal experience, that personal connection that you have um, to, to something that you've been witnessing or investigating or thinking about, um, it becomes unprofessional to show emotions, which again, encourages researchers to take it outside, to lean. I mean, I don't know anybody who has supported a, re a PhD student um, in their private life <laughs> knows how much weight that is to carry actually, um, especially in the later stages. Um, it's, it's a, it, there's a, there's a whole sort of world beyond the academic environment that is affected, affected by the conditions that PhD, PhDs often work under. Um, and I think that holds that kind of separation means, and you're, you're, you're having to kind of leave your emotions at the door when you kind of go to work, um, is, is partly what contributes, there's many factors, but partly what contributes to burnout, to secondary traumatic stress, to um, an inability to incomplete PhDs, um, to dropout rates, to um, and to even those people who manage to finish, to then people going, I can't do this. I have to change field. I can't research this subject anymore, even though they've just become an expert in that subject and their knowledge is valuable and so on but because it has been such a traumatic experience to do that research they they disengage from the topic um or we we i also did i went and studied something else <laughs> afterwards i i i um the idea of spending a few more years studying what it is i needed a break um and i think this has a lot to do with how we understand emotion 
um, in and the, the role that emotion has in research, whether it's a problem, it, it's, it's seen as a problem, a limitation, a kind of your human error aspect, um, that it's stigmatized to show emotion and to incorporate emotion in certain settings. I mean, not everywhere, of course. Um, there are many uh, uh, places where there's, there's people are already talking about this, but I think it's quite common um, for it to be considered inappropriate. Um, and that leads to exclusion and, and, and um, not only of people actually, but also of ideas. I think you lose a lot of data when you're not using that experience, that personal experience and that emotional reaction when you have, when you're not engaging that in your research, you are actually missing out um, on, and I've certainly found writing about certain topics very difficult if I can't include um, the experiences that went around the data that I produced in the end. Um, so it's sort of, then it, you think about, okay, well, what do we, what happens then if we start to value emotion and start to give it a place um, in our research, in academic environments, um, in our publications, in our methods, um, which I mean, I've in the at ACMS for the last few years, I've learned a huge amount about using arts-based methodologies to um, and and different ways that you can insert yourself as a researcher. This is also a positionality issue, right? Um, not pretending that you have as a researcher a kind of neutral lens, but actually engaging your positionality in order to build your analytical framework and to understand the, the, the effects, the, the role that you have to play as a person um, in what in, in your findings and in your um, in the data that you've collected and how you analyze it. But that's but there's also um, I think this aspect of, of, yeah, somehow bringing in those things that you can't count, those, um, those, those informations that are better told as a story or, or better presented through poetry or um, um, more evocative in that way and more kind of honest in that way than if we kind of write a nice, well-referenced paragraph that ends up in a paper. Um, and yeah, I think we can do a lot to recognize the more sort of embodied and emotional evidence that we associate with, um, that, are so, that is associ inevitably associated with witnessing injustice um, as researchers. The second question that I think is worth exploring is what skills and support and institutional structures and resources do researchers need um, to contribute meaningfully to knowledge of injustice or trauma traumatic events um, and experiences and so on. Um, and how to, ha um, also what they need in order to conduct research in traumatogenic environments and in, in bad working conditions um, or poor working conditions maybe. Um, I think there's two, Wait, well, okay, I'll say something about two different aspects. One is the sort of the research design and the preparation, right, for research. Um, how to incorporate training into research designs and not expect that the training comes before the research design, but to recognize that that training process is also not something that you can do all up front, but that needs to kind of be something you come back to because you may, as we did, discover you need things once you're in the field. Um, so that you can go into the field better equipped, um, especially, I think, if you're responsible for other people. Um, if you are, it, it, to me, that you have to be, if you're going to be project managing, if you're going to be um, in, responsible for field researchers and have people working for, it is for you because it's on your PhD, right? You're the one who walks away at the end of the day with the PhD. Um, that you need to have training on how to do that and not just wing it. Um, self, there's also self-care aspects, um, which is an individual responsibility, but of course there's huge amounts to be learned. And I think if we talk about it more, we have more opportunities to learn from people who have developed um, techniques or, or practices that help them. Um, and the more ideas we get, 
the more we are, we, the more likely we are, I think, to find something that's useful for us. Um, we can also do things like uh, plan recovery periods of reflection or reflection moments, moments of reflection um, after traumatic, uh, traumatogenic field work um, or reorder so that you don't, you know, so you first do maybe arts based analysis before you do your more thematic analysis or whatever it is. Um, but definitely giving kind of, these are things that you can incorporate quite easily into designs of, of research plans. Then there's institutional structures, right? Um, so diverse, um, diverse and holistic support, um, which means creating safe spaces to talk about these things as you have done. Um, doing a wide range of training because, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I, I think, Certainly, I know that there are other PhD students who have had different kinds of training, but I think um, I, usually it's it's very it's the practical skills. Yeah, I, I didn't feel I haven't heard that much training. I think we're as academics in general, we also often don't get taught how to teach, for example, <laughs> and yet we're expected to be able to do it. Um, so definitely, like what kind of skills people need. Um, uh, uh, and, and, and providing those kinds of opportunities and outsourcing them to people who know better than maybe than, than is available inside a university. Um, and well thought out supervision structures so that there isn't this kind of organizational collapse um, when you're all researching a traumatogenic topic. Um, and also support for supervisors, right? I mean, that it's not only about providing, but if you are providing to support to a, a researcher, you also may need um, support. I mean, therapists know this very well, right? That you that they will also have their own therapist um, in order to not uh, um, crumble under the weight of, of their clients' um, traumas or whatever it is. Awareness raising, um, which again, I'm very glad that you are doing <laughs> um, and talking about the problems and recognizing and developing the emotional and resilient skills. I think the skill sets that are unspoken about um, that that people have developed sometimes because well out of absolute necessity. Um, and but also discussing those, comparing those, recognizing them for the value that they actually have for research in these kinds of um, fields. Then there's the issue of ethics review. Um, I think, unfortunately, um, ethics review is often sort of treated like a permitting system or an authorization system where you apply and some, some committee decides whether or not you've passed. Um, and I, I think that misses the point really of ethics. Ethics is a should be a conversation, it should be a process, it should be ongoing, it shouldn't just be one moment at the beginning of the research before you know what the field is like, it should be an ongoing process and an engagement with the researcher who is putting themselves in potentially risky situations or um, engaging with um, difficult subjects. Um, and it's a question of how do we empower that researcher? How do we, how can we use ethical, what we know about ethics to, um, to support this research rather than saying, well, it's too risky, so no. Um, and I think the system, the way that it often works, this permitting system, what you end up with is that you, it actually breeds, um, distrust and, and researchers don't trust ethics committees and ethics committees don't trust researchers um, and that's not very productive. And then as a final note, I think um, this also can be something picked up by funding bodies. Um, it is these kinds of structures and support mechanisms and trainings and what have you, they factor into, but they must factor into budgets as well. And that has to be acceptable um, for funding applications that you can put those kinds of um, those kinds of financial responsibilities on the funders as opposed to the researchers. And I'll end there. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara. Uh, in my book, uh, experts are those who not only describe situations, but also um, come up with good suggestions to remedy uh, 
problems and um, uh, you have uh, certainly uh, done so with, 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 with your article and, and the work uh, you have done on the basis of, of this particular um, project that has been very inspiring to read and now even more so to listen to. Um, you and I have been talking about this before, but in, I mean, you mentioned a lot of symptoms that people dealing with, with, with these situations come into anxiety, compassion, fatigue, panic attack, nightmares, uh, hypersensitivity, burnout syndromes, etc. Uh, from my position as one of the supervisors of, of PhD students and others, uh, what I often encounter is that people go down with stress. That's sort of the self-diagnosis. I am extremely stressed. I've been to the doctors, you know, I didn't sleep well. Um, uh, and uh, I apparently have stress uh, because writing a PhD is very demanding. And sort of the career structure puts so much pressure on you. But almost all the students that I have been involved with have done exactly these kinds of field works uh, that are, you know, among people who, who suffer uh, and they feel that they can do very little to release uh, uh, harm uh, and, and the, the, the situations that people are in and they somehow blame themselves also uh, from this. Uh, have you also detected uh, this, that people can sort of talk about stress, but not necessarily the other things? Uh, 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 and, and how do we get beyond this detection of stress as related only sort of to the physical uh, uh, working pressure, but also sort of to include uh, uh, the emotional drains that 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 you talk about in 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 the conversations we have among ourselves as academics. Yeah, I I think that stress gets used um, as a, a kind of it seems to be a catch-all term <laughs> uh, for what someone's going through. It's a it's an acceptable term. You can be stressed because of external factors, whereas other things like trauma um, or, or nightmares or, or um, panic attacks are somehow, I think, to, maybe less accepted or more stigmatized, or I'm not entirely sure, but it means that people, I mean, I also, I, I wouldn't, I mean, a lot of people found it, that I was working closely with, only found out what I was going through in my private life years after um i think it's um yeah i think i mean it's you start by having the conversation you start by hearing other people having the conversation then maybe the junior researchers feel that they can also join that conversation and mm. can share these things it's not necessarily always appropriate to talk to the supervisor um because you can't I think you do need different things from different people and and a supervisor is your has a has a has an important role to play and you the last thing you want is your supervisor thinking you've gone mad and you can't do your phd <laughs> that's that's not going to help um so and, there's and a I've, power there's a power structure there that, there's a that. power structure there's a there's um there's perceptions there's there's um there's the the sort of the person that you want to, you know, the position that you want to have in relation to that person. Um, so that's why I say supervision structures, because I think, you know, we have this, and we already know this about other aspects, um, that there's this, there can be, there has for a long time been a sort of a, a power dynamic between supervisors and their supervisees who, that can be very detrimental. Um, uh, uh, to junior researchers. So I think this is just yet another aspect yeah. of that conversation. Um, how to get beyond it? I mean, beyond, yeah, the, the more it becomes normal to talk about these things. I do think that, I mean, certainly for me, the, the research methodology that is that is more um, 
welcoming of, of effective data, um, performance methods and arts methods and poetry. And um, I think those spaces and the, 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 the research that does, that when, you do it, when you're engaging with those kinds of researchers, I do think there's more space for these conversations, which gives me the confidence that we can extend that. Um, into into more traditional uh, fields of methodology. Um, I think there's something. I mean, I so I've been also spending the last few years thinking a lot about privilege um, and and studying also privilege migration. And I think um, one of the things that is worth thinking about is how we use that privilege. As academics, we're not the ones directly experiencing most of the time. Okay, there are definitely exceptions, notable exceptions. Um, but most of the time we are, have, well, highly educated <laughs> um, who with, with and, and we have this institution to escape to and the support of an institution in varying degrees and um, we are entering a space and then we can leave it. Um, and I think a lot of that guilt that you were talking about where you kind of, you have to sideline yourself and and you're responsible and it's not right that, you know, you can interview someone, you can be in that moment with them and then you can close the door and go home and they're stuck and you leave someone behind. Someone that you've, because you're sharing a traumatic experience with or, or, or sharing their traumatic experience, you've become very intimate with. So um, I think that there's a way that it's certainly, that's a privilege, I would count that as a privilege that you can step away from the injustice, the suffering, you can close your door, you can watch a movie, you can not talk about it or, or uh, go out for a dinner or whatever it is. So, but, and that how to you make that, rather than that being an escape mechanism, how to make that useful and productive mm -hmm. um, and, and to use it in a way that benefits the person who doesn't have that privilege. Yeah, uh, that, that's uh, definitely uh, true and uh, I mean, we, we often find that a lot of our colleagues and ourselves included, at least myself included, that it's very difficult to whine uh, about uh, having difficulties in the field when you know that the people you work among have so much more uh, problems to deal with that are much more serious, you would say, uh, than, than you uh, feeling badly or having bad dreams or whatever, exactly because you have the privilege that you can escape but then that privilege becomes guilt. Mm. So you have that on the one side. But then on the other side, uh, and that may connect maybe to the alternative methodologies that, that you uh, are speaking about. On the other side, migration research also works in a very politicized field. Mm -hmm. And migration research may at certain moment be under attack for being very politicized, not objective, not providing the kind of data that um, uh, uh, politicians or funders or uh, other bodies would like to see at a, a given moment. Uh, we've just been through such uh, a debate um, in, in Denmark. Uh, I know that's also been the case in, in some other European countries. So, I mean, how do we juggle all these different demands of allowing emotions to be in the field, use alternative methods, being criticized for being uh, for providing politicized uh, 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 publications, uh, uh, whatever kind of dissemination that we now do. How do have have you thought about? I mean, how to juggle these very different demands when you at the same time have this feeling of, of privilege? Um, well, no, no. Um, <laughs> That's okay. I don't have the answer. Um, no, I juggling. Uh, I mean, the, I, okay, so on the what to break it down a little bit. I, I know we've talked about this before. I kind of, well, okay, there's this aspect of when you've, uh, been traumatized and then you've gone through therapy and you've become more, much more aware of what trauma is and what it looks like you start to see it everywhere so <laughs> I do think you know a lot of that kind of you can see when you're reading migration research how I mean that is about these very difficult subjects 
the anger coming through. You can feel that emotion. And I do think that also comes across to uh, policymakers and, and is directed often at them, right? Um, and, and not that there's no good reason for that, but I think that kind of repressed emotional response covered up with data is not an, an academic writing, um, is in, in a way not doing justice to it and, and therefore not commun effectively communicating where it's coming from and, and, and um, what, it, what it is mm -hmm. and, and what it means. Um, and I do think, so I do think that the more we do kind of invite the emotion into the analytical process and the reflection process, we'll be better equipped to explain um, to 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 explain with other people. The other part of it is is yes, sitting with the discomfort of injustice, right? And that's something that um, that also comes back to privilege. It's a privilege to be shocked by injustice because you've not experienced it before, um, because it's not a part of your daily life, because it's something you had to go physically somewhere else, a place that we've labeled the field which is not the field to the people who are there, um, but it's, it's just home or life or where they've ended up or um, it's their reality. So we, I think it, the, the, the discomfort and, and then we bring that back and then we try and communicate what we've witnessed to people who we feel, I think in, or I mean, at least I do, that policymakers have a lot to do with this and, and, and the, the, that they have a lot of power to fix it and it's not being addressed. So I think, I, so I, I, there's that frustration and you end up in this kind of lock that is not, um, uh, yeah, yeah, that is, that is, there is emotions going on there, but they're not being discussed mm -hmm. um and and from both sides i think a lot of the time you know um it's being accused of being the perpetrators <laughs> of of border deaths is also um is, is not an invitation necessary to engage in a productive way um so sitting with the discomfort is also of of injustice is also something that you have to learn if you've if you're not if it's not your direct experience mm -hmm. um so how to juggle it? Um, yeah, I, we, <laughs> I feel like I'm a bit of a stuck record, but we just need to keep working yeah. on it. It's not something that there's a sort of a, a, a golden solution for. No. Um, but these are definitely some of the issues that need to be addressed in, inside. I mean, the very first thing that we can do is, okay, if, if there's a hostile environment outside and there's a hostile or, or uh, kind of working condition in or, or and traumatogenic environment in in um, in the places where we go to conduct our research, then at the very least, the very first thing we can do is create kind of safe spaces inside yeah. the academic homes, yeah. um, and and see where we can go, what we can come up with from that. <laughs> no, definitely, uh, and uh, we are trying to go there. Uh, I have a last uh, short question. Uh, uh, you write in your article and, and briefly mentioned that uh, uh, people with personal experience with trauma often are attracted to study these kinds of subjects, but also that they might be better equipped or have useful coping mechanisms. Can you maybe expand uh, on how and, and what these coping mechanisms are? Um, okay, uh, yeah, so I, I think one of the, so I got this idea from reading a book about, um, uh, uh, by a woman who was doing interviews, uh, it was her job to interview, uh, uh, terrorists, terrorists, um, on behalf of the, the security forces, military and so on. Um, and she talks about where her skill set comes from. It wasn't something that she learned, although she, of course, honed it with experience. Um, but where her skills came from, why did she know that a terrorist was hiding some, or that a person that she, an informant, let's not label, but an informant was hiding something or knew something and wasn't admitting it? Um, 
she had this instinct for it. And so she, um, in the book, she goes back, she takes you back to exploring where uh, a, a traumatic um, experience in her childhood where she was raped. And she talks about the skills that she picked up from that traumatic experience and from the reaction, um, uh, um, the, the, her life that had a kind of unfold, how it unfolded after the trauma. And, and um, one of them was resilience, her ability to, under incredibly stressful conditions, like we've heard there is a bomb threat, it's your job to find out if this informant knows anything so that we can save potentially thousands of people. Um, you know, that the, to, the ability to keep working and to cut her emotions out. And, and that kind of, those sort of skills were something that she identified as coming from that mm -hmm. traumatic experience. Another one was this kind of sixth sense about, um, some, about hiding, so that somebody was hiding information. And it, she associated with that feeling of unsafety, like, um, I, she knows when some she because she has a heightened sense of security then she knows if somebody is unsafe because they're hiding something and they're potentially violent or whatever it is so I think so to me I read that book and I started to think yes these these are a lot of skills I do think that I mean not that anybody who had that you need to have experienced trauma in order to research trauma but I do think that what I most people that I know are drawn, who, who are drawn to these kinds of topics are drawn because of something that they've personally experienced. So um, that they understand it better, maybe a heightened empathy to mm -hmm. people experiencing trauma and people suffering. Um, so I do think that there are certainly skills there um, that maybe need to be identified as skills and recognized as skills um, and, and developed so that they're not unhealthy. Um, but yeah, I think it, there's other skills um, that are that are used by researchers um, that we don't name, um, yeah. and maybe it would help to name them. Yeah. Now I could keep on, but <laughs> I can see that uh, a lot of our uh, attendees are very keen to join the discussion here. So I will do my best uh, to make justice uh, to to the questions and comments uh, in in the. Uh, questions and, and, and answer uh, bottom here. And the first uh, comment is from me, Clement, who uh, uh, directs our attention to a um, uh, homepage uh, by Mede Nip, a Danish uh, anthropologist and psych uh, psychotherapist um, who has written about these issues. And I have also uh, consulted her, her work and uh, I, like me, uh, highly recommend it for those who are interested in that. Uh, Eline Verb uh, thanks you for a very interesting presentation and uh, ask if you could recommend PhD students uh, working in refugee camps uh, and interacting closely with camp residents. Uh, uh, any particular fieldwork skills? I don't know if you I mean, it's not your direct work field, but some of the camp situation could be similar to the arch archival uh, situation, uh, at least if it's closed camps. So answer straight away. Yeah, do that. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, it's 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 not my area, and and um, it wasn't a situation that I have direct experience of. Um, so I would the first thing I would do is encourage them to talk to other researchers who have um, direct experience so that they, because there's, I mean, there's a lot I can say about um, the kind of research that I did, but it is quite context specific, I think. Um, but I do think maybe one useful technique is, is um, while we're busy and it's our responsibility to be recording the data um, the, from interviews and the facts and the, those kind of, also find ways to record the reactions, your reactions, your, um, and I do think this is a practice often amongst people to journal, to uh, keep logbooks, to, um, but it, you know, you can be more creative also. It doesn't have to be something that is written. I think in academia, we're a little bit sometimes um, narrow in, in what we think an output is. Um, 
so so finding a way i mean i created a file um that i called my emotional phd and every time i came back from the field or when i was in the field and i had had a awful day i would write out everything that i needed to get out of my system and i would save it in my emotional phd so that it because it i felt it was supposed to be separate i mean i think that actually i could have integrated it but at that time that helped um so that it was going somewhere no and uh, i i i i really appreciate uh, that uh, good idea and uh, i know of i i've worked with that myself uh, to to some success at least, and, and also recommended it. Uh, but uh, Anne Bach uh, uh, is trying to sort of pressure us and you in, in this moment to, to go a little further on saying how to integrate emotions in the analytical uh, uh, and direct research work papers output. You've already spoken uh, a bit about that, mm. but how you sort of integrate that. Do you have uh, any experience with, with, with doing that? Yeah, again, I mean, at least um, I go, I, yes, um, there are people much better positioned and, and with much more experience in this than me. Um, so I would, yeah, there's um, a, a, even a series, a colleague of mine, uh, Dudun Lovo, she just sent a, there's a series of um, poetry workshops, poetry is research workshops that are coming up. Um, that are all about how, you know, trying to see what kind of research has kind of been embodied um, and, and, and bringing that out. Um, or, or, and that's just one example, one workshop that caught my eye. Um, so certainly just look into it. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people who are working on these methods. Um, I am, I mean, at least <laughs> in the, the ACMS, I was one of the by far the most conventional researchers. So <laughs> um, I, I don't know that I, but one of the things that I have wanted to do since I finished my PhD or since I actually finished my data collection is to write a book about mm -hmm. a novel about the, um, uh, that about the uh, uh, the experience of doing yeah. uh, of being a border death detective as yeah. we call ourselves, yeah. um, and I think it would I, I, there was no funding for that, right? So um, that's the difficulty. It's how to I don't think it's so much how to come up with these ideas, but how to incorporate them as sort of paid projects. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I also see my my colleagues moving more and more into different kinds of creative uh, writing, mm -hmm. taking courses, taking their research. They're long elsewhere, traditions, right? They're long doing, traditions. Yeah, doing documentaries, um, mm -hmm. writing po poetry, and so on. Um, moving on with the questions here, I see uh, Julia Vedersliu is um, uh, going back to sort of the guilt. Uh, she works with uh, conflicts between indigenous community and settler colonists and uh, her feeling of compassion fatigue and, and guilt uh, uh, comes from feeling that she can move in and out of their context, as you also mm -hmm. uh, talked about, write about their problems and then obtain a degree. Uh, uh, and also, though she tries to help with writings, meetings, advocacy, scholarship, etc., she feels it's insufficient, but also that the people she worked with have unrealistic uh, expectations as regard to what she or any of us might be able to do, which of course is no uh, surprise as people with little left but hope need to be very hopeful. <laughs> that something or someone will be able to, to provide uh, some way out. Um, do, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, I, I think it's hope. I think it's also power. I mean, it, we maybe can't see our power. That's, I mean, okay, it's also something I'm challenging a little bit, but in my research, but there is this kind of axiom that privilege makes you unaware of privilege, right? Um, so so while we may not, while we may feel powerless, maybe what we're feeling is that tiny, tiny shred of the powerlessness that we're witnessing. Um, and that actually we do have power. Um, and, and then it becomes a question of how do we 
choose to use that power? How do we choose to use that privilege? I would recommend looking at privilege. I've, it certainly helped me to unpack this guilt issue um, and also to make it because there's a lot of, I don't think that the guilt is useful. I, I mean, not to say that it's it's that, that anybody is doing anything wrong if they're feeling guilty. I think it's a totally natural reaction, but I think it's also about, it, it, beca it manifests as guilt because we don't talk about privilege. Um, and, and what privilege is and, and how to manage it um, and how to deal with it and what kind of responsibilities you have as somebody who has privilege. Um, so it certainly helped me to kind of, um, and there is a lot that has been written um, about privilege. I'm very bad at names, so I cannot remember <laughs> the names of the articles off the top of my head, um, but I will, mm -hmm. um, yes, they are, I found them, so I'm sure that you can too. <laughs> Yeah, I see that uh, Julia is just one comment uh, further down uh, self, uh, herself commencing on that it's important to communicate uh, clearly to research participants that their benefits will probably be minimal and that you don't promise too much. Uh, I, I really appreciate that, but I also know from experience that no matter what you say, I mean, your mere being there creates expectations, if not for bettering local life uh, circumstances, then at least that the knowledge you possess, say, in how to beat migration control, what is the law, what are the countries, what are the ways of going there, that people expect you to be able to give something back. Uh, and that, I think, is always a, a personal uh, question, how mm -hmm. far uh, you 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 uh, go into to that direction. Yeah, now, I, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, please. No, I I think there's maybe a couple. I mean, I I th I, I worry sometimes about not that you should make promises. Absolutely, that you can't fulfill. And I I have also done that and then tormented myself over the fact that I couldn't deliver what I thought I could deliver. Um, so de definitely not about giving making false promises. But I do think. It's about, I think you, people underestimate maybe how much just holding. So while they may be asking for something, even the act of asking and you not saying, I can't, it's not my, you know, not meeting a brick wall can in itself be valuable. And I think there's, um, I, want, I worry sometimes that kind of this emphasis on not making an, I can't do anything for you and you're not going to have any benefits. Not that we should mislead them, but that it's not just pushing it back, um, that that kind of hopelessness and powerlessness, not just pushing it back onto the people who are already in a powerless situation. Um, so I think it's maybe a little bit more about also not promising, but not, but also holding it um, or, or mm. leaning out. You know, mm. there's this circle mm. of care theory where the person who's directly um, uh, affected by something leans on their support network and they lean on their support network and that way things can be held whereas if you lean in um, you end up putting everything on the person who's already suffering and struggling. I think we have time for the last uh, question comment here um, and it sort of leads back to what I already um, uh, asked you. So Henry Grønsbo, an old colleague of mine, nice to see you here, um, says that you state that we need to bring emotion into academic work, but I would like you to unpack this notion further and point to the sources that you would draw on in this process, or put differently, through what concepts do we bring emotional life, including our own, into the analysis of data. So this is not about alternative outlets, what we do on the side, ways of, of, of disseminating uh, uh, through different outlets, but in the sort of pure academic journal article that goes through peer review and have to live up to uh, those criteria. How do we bring our own emotional life and what goes on emotionally in the encounters uh, in empirical research, how do we bring that into the analysis? Do you have any suggestions or experience um, with doing that? So, uh, two, I would say, points. Um, 
One, I think part of it is um, rather than setting aside your emotional reaction to data, um, to process it as part of the analysis pro and, and to understand that as part of the analysis process, um, rather than kind of separating the two. I think that's, I mean, that's what I did in my PhD. I separated the two. <laughs> and I don't know that that, um, and it, well, later on in my PhD, I think I came back to kind of bringing it back in. Um, but I think um, if you process your emotional reactions to the data, you then understand, you know, while it may be a, a small comment that somebody makes that doesn't kind of quantitatively show up in every interview or doesn't um, come up as necessarily a recognizable theme, but it's something you have a powerful reaction to that sticks with you, that if you understand your emotional reaction to it, maybe you find out that actually that is a very vital piece of information that actually needs to become something that you emphasize in your findings, in your academic work. And not that you write about the emotional reaction, but you are, use your emotional reaction to identify what is actually a very significant piece of data. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other, I think, um, is, is uh, yeah, it's about, yeah, I think as a process, as a result of that, as a, a result of incorporating your emotional responses um, and understanding them better, you, like I said before about, um, I mean, the number of articles that I've written about, or not written, read, well, also written, <laughs> but read about uh, uh, injustice in, in migration. And, and, um, and you can feel the anger that's coming through, but it's not being talked about, right? So I think if you do the processing work and you understand your emotion, actually, I think it gives greater clarity also in your academic writing. I think, you know, I, I got very frustrated with the fact that so many articles start with this horror story about border deaths, about a border death, somebody drowning or somebody, some horrific thing happening to someone. And then the rest of the article has nothing to do with that person or that, that, that experience or that story. And then you wonder, okay, well, did you do it just to provoke me into feeling, mm -hmm. I mean, what was the point? Um, so, so I, and I think- Some kind of so social do, pornography in a way. Well, yeah, kind of, or, or, and I think it's maybe from the author, like, I need you to understand my emotional response to this subject. So I'm gonna just tell you this horror story <laughs> so that you're in the same place that I am when you read the rest of what I have to say. Um, so, I, 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 so I think these are not necessarily effective ways of doing it. And I think the incorporating your emotional responses mm -hmm. as a kind of valid way of understanding something um, and, and giving space to it in the analysis process can, can actually result in better quality mm -hmm. uh, academic articles. Thank you so much, uh, Tamara. Um, I, I remember a book from the early 1990s, 1990 or 91, perhaps, written by Renato Rosalto, uh, Rosaldo on, on uh, Headhunters Grief. I don't remember the exact title, but Headhunters and Grief is definitely in the title, maybe Truth as well. That remains one of the best accounts uh, I have read on how to incorporate personal trauma into your academic uh, writing. So I can recommend that book to those of you who ask uh, for concrete recommendations to you, Tamara. Thank you so much for accepting uh, uh, the invitation to have this talk. Uh, I, I can see from the uh, questions and engagement that you really uh, um, are talking into something that, that people find important. Thank you to the audience uh, uh, for staying with us um, and a little bit over time, maybe. No, not until a min un in, in a minute. Uh, it's uh, been uh, a pleasure. Um, and uh, don't miss uh, the, the final and last seminar. And remember, if you are unavailable on that particular day, it's just like with Netflix or 
or <laughs> HBO or the other things you can always stream uh, from from the the these uh, web page so you won't miss um, uh, an important seminar if it's important to you but thank you so much and uh, I wish all of you uh, a good rest of the day thank you bye bye bye